Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. We also have Vice Chair Carter. Can you hear me, Mr. Carter? I can hear you fine, thank you. And Commissioner Boswell. Can you hear me, Mr. Boswell? I can. Great. They're joining us remotely so that we uh, conform to the governor's order of gatherings no larger than 10 people. Also present tonight in the room right now are Bruce Walker, our IT director, Brian Haygood, our county manager. Claude Albright, our county attorney, Tori Frank, our clerk to the board, Susan Evans, our finance director, Sheriff Terry Johnson, and Jeremy Aikens, our tax administrator. So as we uh, get to work tonight, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to offer an invocation. We have had a lot of pain in our community since we last met. We've had tornadoes that have come through Southern Alamance County and caused a lot of damage. Thankfully, no body was injured but a lot of damage to property and lives further upended on top of what we've been dealing with with the virus we've also had tragic death in our community in other ways um, I thought tonight I would read uh, Psalm 19 the first six verses of it as our invocation uh, I heard on a sermon that I was listening to yesterday on Sunday that said Psalm 19 was the verse that the astronauts on the Apollo mission uh, read uh, around the moon landing. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but uh, it's this beautiful passage and I'd like to share it tonight as the invocation. So this is Psalm 19, verse one. The heavens tell out the glory of God. The vault of heaven reveals his handiwork. One day speaks to another, night with night shares its knowledge, and this without speech or language or the sound of any voice. Their music goes out through all the earth, their words reach to the end of the world. In them a tent is fixed for the sun, who comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, rejoicing like a strong man to run his race. His rising is at one end of the heavens, his circuit touches their farthest ends, and nothing is hidden from his heat. So, if you would please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So tonight we are going to have public speakers. Um, we have in our notice for this hearing, we had two ways where people could sign up, either through emailing their comments to the clerk to the board who would read them, or by calling in on a designated telephone number. I understand that we have some type statements that have been submitted, but is it correct, um, Clerk Frank, that none of those statements pertain to agenda-related items? And I understand that nobody uh, asked for us to call them during the meeting. Is that right as well? Okay, great. So we'll go on to approval of the agenda. I'll make the motion to approve it. Second. Thank you. Mr. Lashley has moved that we approve the agenda, and Mr. Sutton has seconded it. All in favor, please say aye. 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 I heard an aye from Mr. Boswell. Uh, Mr. Carter, are you with us? I did. I had my phone on mute for you. <laughs> Do you vote to approve the agenda? Yes. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is approval of the consent agenda. Motion made. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Does anybody have any questions? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 
her Mr. Carter and Mr. Boss will both vote aye. So the consent, consent agenda is approved. Next on our agenda is a discussion from about late listing penalties with the tax department and Jeremy Akins, our tax administrator. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me here tonight. All right. So businesses in the state of North Carolina are required to list their personal property for taxation no later than January 31st of each year. Um, if the businesses file for extension by the uh, January 31st, then the deadline is moved to April 15th. Many businesses choose to file an extension because they reconcile their personal property filing with their state and federal income tax filing. The April 15th date allows them to prepare both filings together and submit simultaneously. Due to COVID-19, many businesses are struggling to meet filing deadlines, and both the state of North Carolina and the United States of America have recognized the need for additional time by extending the income tax deadline to July 15. The state of North Carolina has chosen not to extend the deadline for filing local personal property taxes. The North Carolina Department of Revenue has recommended that counties consider waiving late list penalties. While counties may not move the deadline to list personal property, they may waive any and all associated fees, de facto creating an extended filing time. Now in Alamance County, we find that late listers usually either fail to obtain an extension during the month of January or fail to list altogether. Those businesses who file for an extension on time nearly always submit their listing by the deadline. In most years, fewer than 10 businesses will file for extension and list after the April 15th cutoff. Often this is fewer than five and we've had years where the number is zero. Our businesses who file extensions are very faithful to follow through and list timely. As of today's count, we have about 450 businesses that have timely filed extensions. They have not failed to list in previous years, but they did not submit their listing by the April 15 deadline. Now, doubtless some are still in the mail, but not enough to significantly change that number. Um, there's no way to know at this time the actual, uh, what the actual late listing penalty will be. Uh, we'll not know this number until the listings are received and the property is assessed. However, based on the historical average late listing penalties, we might expect this number to be as high as $75,000. Uh, now, under ordinary circumstances, these businesses would likely have submitted their listings on time. Uh, we have not been receiving this revenue in previous years. We have not been budgeting on it. Um, instead, this is a one-time windfall caused by COVID-19. <coughs> um, if the board would like to consider waiving the late list penalties, um, I would suggest that this be made effective only for those who have timely filed extensions with our office who submit their listing by a date specified by the board. Um, I would note that depending on how close such a date would come to our billing in July, for example, the, the state and federal movement to July 15th, by July 15th, we're producing bills. With that in mind, we would probably either split bill, so we would bill everything but business personal, and perhaps a month later, bill the business personal, um, or if it's feasible, depending on how the numbers are looking as we get close, we may bill just what we have and individually generate bills for the stragglers. It just kind of depends on, on what we're seeing. Uh, this would not incur an additional cost the way that our agreement is set up with our, our print vendor. They don't care if it's one large batch or if it's split. Uh, so that should not be a concern. You might have a situation where a business, if they receive their bill later because of this delay, if they like to pay early for a discount, they're coming up close on that deadline. They might even miss that deadline. Although I would say to lose half a percent on the early payment deadline to save 10% on a late listing penalty is a pretty good deal. Um, are there any questions that you might have for me? I'll make the motion we approve the uh, July uh, deadline and, and meet those goals. For them to meet the <coughs> I, I tend to agree with Bill on that. There's a lot of confusion in the tax world today mm -hmm. because of the 
late federal and then the state's late and everybody's late. So mm-hmm. I think we do need to extend this out. And I'll second his motion on that. There's a lot of businesses that are really suffering mm-hmm. because they can't they can't produce any income because they're uh, not allowed to be open. Mm-hmm. The government had work again. Mm-hmm. It was very surprising to me, as I said, we don't see more than ten in a year, and that's a yeah. that's a bad year to see four hundred and fifty. That kind of tells a story to me. So before we vote on the motion, um, or I have a question. So, mm-hmm. what um, what date would you suggest? Because you said in your presentation that we need to set a date. Was your suggestion that we set it for July fifteenth? It could be any date uh, that the the board would like to set. Um, it makes the most sense for the accountants for it to be July fifteenth because they like to co-file. They file at the same time because they want to be reconciled between both filings. So it makes a lot of sense to be July fifteenth, but but any date. Was that your motion? Yeah, the fifteenth. That's what I was saying. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mr. Sutton, I'm good. You good? I'm good. Mr. Carter, do you have any questions or comments or concerns? No, I support the idea. I think it's a good idea for us to extend it, yeah. Okay, great. We have a motion by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Boswell to um, extend until July 15th the uh, exemption from late listing penalty. Is that the right way to say it? Uh, yes, sir. You, you, mm. You might say that you would grant waiver of the late listing penalty out to July 15th, but it should only be persons that have filed extension. That was done back in January pre-COVID. If they if they didn't file extension, then I wouldn't think they qualify. Agreed. Okay. So do we all understand what we're voting on? Is that yeah. clear? Okay. Then yeah. all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion is carried 5 0. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is to have a budget, budget <coughs> presentation by um, Dr. Bruce Benson, um, the superintendent for the Alamance Burlington School System. So, he, they, our county manager has gone to go get Mr. Benson, Dr. Benson, sorry. <coughs> and Mr. Akins has left to make some room. So we have Jeremy Teeter, the finance officer for ABSS, Dr. Bruce Benson, the superintendent, and Allison Gant, the chair of the Alamance Burlington School Board, and we're counting people. And so Susan Evans, our finance director, is excusing herself so that we are no more than 10 people. And it looks like the sheriff has stepped out and Bruce Walker, our IT person, has stepped out. So we are conforming to the statute, to the, um, excuse me, the executive order of no more than 10 people. Hi, Dr. Benson. Welcome. Hey, I'm glad to see you. Thank and, you. And, um, Please proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and members of the board. We appreciate the opportunity to bring the school board's funding request to you this evening. And I assume we've got a couple of folks that are participating remotely as well. Uh, I'm going to provide a very brief, uh, very general overview, and then we'll ask Mr. Teeter to come to the podium and provide um, some more specific uh, information. So first of all, I just wanted to take a little bit of a historical look at what the ask has been over the last uh, five years. Um, Dr. Benson, before you get too far into it, um, Mr. Carter and Mr. Boswell, do you have a copy of Dr. Benson's presentation? I do. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. So we're on we're on the, the first uh, slide after the title slide, and it's just uh, it's taking a look at what the requests have been for the last uh, the last five years. Uh, last year of which was of, uh, our, my first opportunity to have some influence on what that funding request looked like. Uh, we did a fair amount of redirecting uh, funds from areas that we felt were not producing the outcomes that we were hoping that they would produce and, and as such our um, operating increasing uh, was uh, at zero dollars. Uh, this year, bottom line up front, uh, we are asking for 3.3 
uh, million dollars. Um, six weeks ago, I guess it was a little bit, uh, almost six weeks ago, the, the board adopted this funding request, and it's um, it's quite the different world that we are in today. And uh, I'm I'm confident that as as we work through this, that there are things in here that we will want to have some uh, conversation about, discussion and reconsideration. And I'm confident the board would have had those uh, those considerations uh, had we known. Um, what kind of situation we might be in six weeks later but uh, again we appreciate the opportunity to share with you all this evening so i uh, just um on the next page we have a, a very brief summary of some of the major items that are included in both the continuation fund and the expansion fund the uh, continuation fund total is about 1.8 um, million dollars uh, that certainly can change depending on what happens with the general assembly as they go back into session on uh, april uh, 28 uh, this was our best estimate uh, based upon what we knew at the time the request was was put together so if you look at some of the major items that are in included some some of which many of which are not really within our control a continuity of local supplements and salaries increased retirement contribution increased health insurance uh, we are looking to um, expand our compensation model for our um, for our SROs uh, and trying to, to get it more uh, get the uh, compensation more in line with the actual cost of the positions uh, we anticipate a new charter school opening up Alamance uh, community school uh, continued support for our uh, specialized programs and uh, putting in an, enhan an enhanced ERP, which happens to be the ERP that you all use, uh, MUNIS, but it's a version that is for, s for school systems. We're looking forward to increased uh, transparency and ability to um, manage uh, workflow. And then in terms of the um, expansion, uh, the first thing on the expansion list is increasing the teacher supplement by a 0.25 uh, percentage points, uh, which would put uh, teachers that are in, uh, have years of experience from 0 to 5 at 10%, um, uh, years of experience from 6 to 10 at 11%, and 11 plus years at 12%. Um, this is something that both the commissioners and the school board have worked on over the years to um, put Elements Burlington in a competitive position with the rest of North Carolina, and we are. Uh, as of last year, we were ranked number 10th in terms of local supplement, and the board would very much like to hold on to that uh, ranking moving forward. Uh, we uh, conducted a classified uh, pay plan, and we're, we implemented the first part of it during this uh, past year. We're looking to expand that into other areas where we're having some challenges in terms of staffing, uh, more specifically uh, some of our skilled trades folks. Um, uh, we're looking for, to implement a strategy with our bus drivers that would uh, put them into a pay banding model where uh, salaries would range from a starting salary of $15 an hour to a maximum of, of $20 an hour that would really distinguish us within the region in, in terms of, we think, attractiveness. Um, there's been a fair amount of conversation about uh, athletic trainers. Uh, we're putting the athletic trainer request in here um, as a safety measure, making sure that we're taking good care of our student athletes. Uh, on and off of the uh, field. We can talk more about that if, if that's the pleasure of the board. Uh, we would like to gradually expand access to nurses in our schools. We'd like to get to the point where we have a, a nurse on staff in each one of our schools. We think that over a period of three, uh, three years we could get there gradually. Uh, we work with a lot of medically fragile students and um, it would be incredibly helpful to have a nurse on staff uh, full-time at each one of our buildings. We're also looking to increase the, the number of SROs, an additional uh, officer from the Sheriff's Office and one from um, Burlington. Uh, you'll see some numbers here in a little bit in terms of the number of students that we are um, supporting that are English language learners and their parents and, and as such a need for increase in interpreter. And there's one that's not on here that I do want to highlight uh, and that is our, our need to, de uh, to develop a replacement cycle for uh, end user technology in the, in the system. Uh, we are heavily dependent upon Chromebooks. Uh, and fortunately, we had a sufficient number of those devices to be able to distribute those to our students in relatively short order, which I think positioned us well to begin to continue uh, classroom instruction at, uh, at home. But we have a large number of devices that are coming uh, up to their end of support period, uh, which means uh, they will no longer be supported by uh, the, the company. And um, not only do they potentially not run, run our software applications, but they will pose a security risk if they're unable to be uh, patched on a regular basis. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask Mr. Teeter to come up and provide a more detailed explanation about Before those Before you requests. go, may I ask a question, and you may yield to Jeremy on this, but over on the continuation side, the uh, 
uh, charter school continuation, new, uh, new charter school. Uh, number one, what what does that mean, or what do you do? How does that work? I should know, but I don't. So we and, anticipate a new charter school opening up in our right. community, which means there will there will there will be some resources that will need to follow children as they move to that new okay. charter He'll school. Explain that. I appreciate. It. And then over on the expansion side, do you have a uh, athletic director for the system? We do have an athletic director for the system. For is it one person? It or? is one person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does he have other jobs Pardon? besides that? Does that person have other jobs besides? Pri primary, his primary responsibility is, is coordinating um, those efforts across the system. The, the difference in terms of the athletic trainers, we're looking for somebody that has that certification uh, in order to be able to provide support for student athletes when they are injured or have suffered a concussion, and we want to make sure that they re return to play and practice in a manner that uh, takes the best care of them um, possible. And so we would prefer to have somebody that has a certification in that area. There's a difference, obviously, uh, and, and I am supportive of, of a director. I mean, the rules are so so uh, varied, to say the least, versus what they used to be, that uh, it's, everybody needs to be on the same page, obviously, with what the rules are coming from uh, Chapel Hill and so forth and so on. Absolutely. Before you go, I'd like to ask you a question also. Uh, on your resource officers for the school, who is responsible? We're paying for their the cost of that resource officer is it the county or the state so mr teeter has a really well-developed breakdown of those costs that he can share with all of you where the resources come from how much of it is a local commitment how much of it comes from the how much of it comes from the state and um, we, we can make that available to you all okay that still didn't answer my question i can has still did well, not well, ask, I'll ask Mr. Teeter then to provide more okay. information. Okay. Okay, I'm going to ask Ms. Teeter. Well, let's um, ask Mr. Carter, do you have any questions of Dr. Benson at this time? Yeah, I do on the additional school nurses. My math's right, isn't it? Can you say your question again, please, Mr. Boswell? Yes, it's on the three additional school nurses, two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. That's like ninety some thousand per nurse. So, Mr. Teeter is going to go through each one of the individual items, and we'll provide more detailed information about the cost and where that cost comes from, and the and the number okay. of number of positions that we're looking to add. Okay. okay. And Mr. Carter, did you have a question? You might want to unmute your phone. I have it unmuted. I don't have a question right now. Okay. Just want to be sure. Thank you. All right, Mr. Peter. Thank you, Chair Gailey. Um, I'll jump directly to Mr. Lashley's question while it's fresh in my head. <clears throat> as far as our traditional high schools yeah um, those are the responsibility of the state and so we do use um, state funding to pay for uh, the school resource officers at the high school level um, the i think they're somewhat disconnected at the state level from what they actually cost uh, and so they, they give us a little less than thirty eight thousand dollars per high school to help us pay for sros and that so they falls, just pay part of the cost. They pay part of the cost, and they've um, they've not updated that formula in a very long time. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that my professional association uh, brings up quite a bit, um, is that they need to update that number to reflect what's going on. So uh, we, for the, for the high school SROs that they provide funding for, uh, we make up the difference between what we're paying mm -hmm. and what they give us. Um, we do have two SROs at the elementary level that they pay for with a grant. So we've tried to take advantage of the grant funding the state started pushing through in the last couple of years. Uh, so the, the two that we added last year uh, for the four most remote elementary schools in the county, um, the state gave us a little over 66000 for those, and we had to come up with the difference. But that really made it possible for us to add those. Uh, and then if they're at a middle school, uh, for example, then we're, we're picking up that cost out of local dollars because uh, it's not part of the state's formula okay. right now. Uh, so it's quite a bit of local money that we're committing uh, to school resource officers, but certainly using every state dollar we can get our hands on. Good. Thank um, 
I see. Um, and then for the, you had a question about the charter schools. Yes. Uh, so we, uh, each month we receive a roster of how many students are in the Alamance County boundaries that attend a particular charter school. And we have to do a calculation for, we take our kids plus theirs, how much money we got, and we divide that out to figure out how much we have to pass on. Um, so the, the new charter school is estimating that they'll have 400 new students in their first year. They're starting with kindergarten through third grade. Um, and so they're, they're estimating 100 students per grade level. So we took um, that number of 200 additional students and plugged that into our typical charter school calculation to come up with how much money we would need to pass on to the new charter school. It may come in a little better than that or a little less than that uh, because they're so close to Orange County and they may end up pulling in some Orange County students instead of Alamance, but we just don't know yet. Uh, so, <clears throat> so after that first year that they're open, we'll get a pretty good feel for how much they're actually going to take uh, but we prepared for a scenario of all of them being from alamance county for the charter school now hypothetically if they were in not in the charter arena but in yours right we wouldn't be a separate line item would it so i mean does that make any sense so if they're so you're saying if they're an existing charter school student moving from one charter school to well, another I mean, or no. Well, it's my lack of knowledge of the budget request, I'm sure, but sure. are you asking for X amount of dollars because of X amount of charter school students? Right. So it would be a loss of it would be a loss of money for us. And so we're trying to make up for that that loss of money that we would have in passing on to the charter school. Okay, but now yeah. if they weren't on a charter school roster uh -huh. and they were in yours, it wouldn't be a separate request, would it? Right. Okay. Got it. Forgive me, I don't quite understand that. Yeah, so state law requires us to share um, the county appropriation and fines and forfeitures with the charter schools. Uh, and so, you know, if we're in a situation where we have stable growth, but then we may be losing 200 students to a new school, we're going to be in a position where we're passing on $200,000 and having to find some way to, to plug that hole. Um, and so that, that's where the need for additional uh, support from the county kicks in for us to maintain our same level of services yeah. but losing, that's an interesting concept yeah. and, and I'd like to know more about it maybe off you know sure off, off time yeah. but uh, what about federal and state money how is that put out there so that is adjusted as well so after the um, after the second month of school um, the Department of Public Instruction takes a look at charter school enrollment and and the public school enrollment uh, and then they adjust our state funding as well so we in order to prepare for that on our side of things, um, we we know we have a certain number of state funded positions and we will hold one or two extra to the side during our allotment process to prepare for the reality that we're probably going to lose some of what they give us at the beginning of the year. So we spend the first few months of the year chasing money. Uh, so we start. they start us out, um, they've already in fact told us this is how many we're going to start you with next year you know we start and then we do start out with that number usually and then we end up losing some throughout the year as they adjust so we have to kind of plan conservatively that we're going to lose some of what we start with uh, due to charter schools um, and some and it impacts federal money too to some extent um, well the, the, the child who leaves presumably ABSS to go to the charter school that's mm -hmm. one less child in ABSS so if you have a hundred children who mm -hmm. go to a new charter school mm -hmm. And they leave ABSS, and so yeah. that money. Understanding the complex yeah. complexity with allotments for yeah. teacher positions and things like that, but um, the simplest way to look at it is that the school system doesn't have to pay for those hundred students that went to the charter school. So you're using county dollars to kind of um, make up that loss in funding so right. it's not a net loss to the school system so the right. students those hundred students that go to the charter school mm -hmm. doesn't result in that money being lost to the public school system because you're requesting the county to come in to fund right. what would have gone yeah. 
what would have stayed if yeah. they hadn't gone to the trial. Exactly. And last and so in last year in part of our budget calculations, we didn't have an issue with charter schools. The charter school enrollment was constant. Uh, and so we were in a position where we were not having to to push out additional dollars to charter schools last year. And so that was not I think it was part of the conversation a couple years ago mm -hmm. at budget time. So it wasn't an issue for us last year because our existing charters were at full capacity and so there weren't additional um, bodies that we could lose and so we're just preparing for that for next year and um, and ideally it'll get back to a stable spot uh, to where that's more predictable and we're not having to to worry about that and there are no consideration for federal state local money on a private institution yeah, and so for a private institution we are um, so we're we're not required to share local money, fortunately, uh, but we, we do have to share some of our federal money. So if we, yep. um, if we have a student at a private school who has um, special learning needs or who, would, who, who qualifies for free or reduced lunch, um, we have a portion of Title I money and a portion of EC money that we have to share uh, with, those, with those private schools. Um, it impacts us in the state arena in the sense that we have less number of students in our classrooms and so the state's going to give us less money but um you know that we're not we're not accounting for them in our enrollment and and the private school enrollment's been pretty steady uh here lately so that's not been a big issue for us on the on the private school front right okay okay um so th this chart just um just as a recap of our funding sources and where they come from um, so as you can see as you might expect the state uh, is the largest share uh, of the financial support for the school system uh, and that that's predominantly four positions and so there's not a lot of that is not very discretionary it, it comes to us with very clear strings uh, for how we need to use that um, and for example Part of that is for school resource officers. Some of that's for teachers, school administrators, et cetera. Um, the, the local share of the pie um, includes the county appropriation. Uh, it, in, it also includes our share of fines and forfeitures that are passed on to us uh, through the, the clerk of court. Um, Federal's the next largest share, and we talked about that a little bit. That's uh, the, the supplemental money that we receive uh, for Title I. Um, and so we've got a fair fair number of schools that uh, qualify for Title I support, as well as federal money that we get to support our students with special learning needs uh, to help bridge those gaps and make up for those extreme expenses um, that can sometimes accrue <coughs> depending on the needs of a student. Uh, the child nutrition and daycare funds are, are, are two enterprise funds, and so we do not depend on your local dollars in order to make those work. Uh, and so those, um, they are self-sufficient and we're not providing any other resources uh, for them to operate um, during this pandemic um, the child nutrition fund is one that we're having to monitor carefully uh, because we're, we're operating we're trying to keep our full staff working and the state has provided leave in order to to protect our our child nutrition employees um, but we're not just dispersing the same number of meals like we would in a normal day-to-day -day basis in a school uh, we are delivering meals and operating food sites but it's just not that same volume that we might see if school were in session and so uh, when we close the month of april we'll have a really full handle of the impact that the pandemic has had on our child nutrition program uh, but they're fortunate as a program that they have a strong enough a fund balance that they've built up over the years by being profitable that they should be able to weather this situation um, our restricted grant fund is our other fund that we have in the chart and that's where we manage um, anytime that we receive a grant for a special purpose um, our North Carolina pre-k money um, is, a, is a big example of that and that's money that we manage um, in the restricted grant fund um, I have a question yes sir what impact do we expect to see on the budget from either in this balance of this year or will, and will any of it flow into next year from the uh, CARES Act distribution? Yes, that's a, an excellent question. So we've, um, at this point, as far as stimulus support, uh, we've received uh, from the state level a one-time allotment of about $861,000 to help us 
close some of the immediate gaps that we've got. Um, for an example, the additional cost that we've spent on, on sanitizing and those supplies, uh, as well as the additional expenses for technology. Uh, we've seen preliminary information on the CARES Act from the federal level of what those dollar amounts could be. Uh, just last week, uh, the State Board of Education um, had a presentation from the Department of Public Instruction on what they're recommending. Um, and the initial plan looks like our school system could receive between five and a half to six million additional dollars as a result of the CARES Act. Um, the state board is supposed to take a vote on that at a future meeting, according to what they said last week. Uh, so when we know what that final number is, our group uh, will come together to figure out what we can do uh, to, to best utilize those resources. But they've, um, they've already started to identify some very clear reasons why we might use that. Um, so we're, we're just waiting on some finality there for the rules and for the precise amount we're going to get. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, the next uh, slide is just is a breakdown from the last fiscal year of, of where we spent our dollars. And as I alluded to earlier, the largest share uh, was for salary and benefits. The, the transfers category that's at the top, that's charter schools. And so that's, that's the amount of dollars uh, that passed through us onto the, the three charter schools in Alamance County. Um, the capital outlay number is higher than the, th uh, the, than the amount of money the county gives us for capital outlay because it includes other projects. Uh, so that includes the expense of our performance contracting that you were a partner with us in um, that we were able to finance through our energy savings. Um, and that also includes the cost of yellow school buses that we have to run on our books that the state uh, ultimately pays for. Um, so that so that's why that number looks higher than what you're normally seeing in our capital improvement plan um, And as you can see supplies and materials um, We spend a healthy chunk on supplies and materials and so I um, So if you hear conversations in the community about We're not providing enough for supplies You can see you've got this number here in front of you how much we're putting out there in the hands of folks for supplies at the school level um, and then our services that that would include services range anywhere uh, from things such as utilities to copier costs um, contracted services for repairs and those sorts of things so there's a wide variety of things that are that are covered under that uh, services category uh, this was a new uh, graphic that we started providing this year just to show our, our top 10 largest vendors um, where we spent our money last year um, we expect some of those to go down, but I think it's interesting to note that one of our charter schools is in that top 10 uh, list, just to give you a sense of how much we pass through to charter schools. Um, we, we, we know that the copier costs will go down uh, because we did approve um, a, cheaper, a cheaper contract uh, for copiers this year, um, and we expect that our, our fees to EMC insurance will go down um, as we've made tremendous strides in our workers' comp space, and so we're, we've, uh, we're going to have some lower premiums there. Um, the, the oil factor will look weird uh, because we're running less school buses right now, so that's going to be an interesting footnote in our books um, for the next year to come. Let me ask you something. Talk yes. about school buses. Yes, sir. If we buy the gas now instead of waiting for it to go back up uh -huh. you know gas basically tanked today you can buy a, yeah. a barrel for 12 cents mm -hmm. is it any way we can yeah. I know that's hard to believe, but that's yeah. true. <laughs> so our uh, our transportation director um, monitors those uh -huh. on a regular basis. What what those prices are trading for, uh, and so we when they're when prices are cheap like that, we work to keep our tanks as full as we Good. can possibly keep them yeah. at the bus garage. Good. And so I imagine we'll be topping that off on a regular basis until this year is over for sure. Because it's going to go back up. It's oh, yeah. just a matter of time. <laughs> Always goes back up, doesn't it? Before uh, you leave. The Duke Energy, you know, years ago you did the uh, windows or the uh, environmental whatever. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be a big savings compared to that number there or that number compared to the years past yeah. and so forth before the windows or whatever was done. What kind of savings have you seen? So I will, um, I will pull some trends for you. It is lower. Um, but I can, uh, I'll run a specific work paper for the, for the county commissioners and the school board on a, say like a five-year trend would be fair how long yeah, ago like was say it? that i'd like to say that yeah that's good yeah well how long ago was it that, that y'all did that it's been within the past five years uh, yeah 
yeah. yeah. So I was not with the system yet, but it wasn't long before. Okay. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to see that. Absolutely. Okay. I was the energy manager at one time in my career. And there's a lot of money to save. Oh, sure. In the lights. Good deal. Yeah. And that's one area where we're expecting, without having students in the building right now, we're expecting some savings with energy and water right now. Um, so we'll, we'll see the utility bills for us run a couple months behind, but we'll see those here soon. Um, well, that was one of my questions that I had tonight was um, with the school buildings being closed, mm -hmm. I know you've had a lot of unusual expenses that have come up because of the shutdown. Yeah. But have you seen savings in other places? And overall, what do you see your budget for fiscal year 2019, 2020 looking like? Are you gonna have a surplus, do you think, at the end of the year because of having the school buildings closed for yeah. pretty much, you know. A quarter, yeah. yeah a quarter plus, I mean, yeah. the, maybe. Yeah. I think it'll be as as April and May progress. It'll be interesting to see that balance, and that's something we're on top of. Um, the biggest examples of that would be our energy and our water, as well as the cost of substitute teachers. Uh, we don't have a need for those right now, um, but for the April April and May pay period, I'd estimate that that's about four hundred thousand um, dollars that will not be spent on substitutes um, that we. Um, will likely need to repurpose uh, for other things as they emerge. Um, and we have asked, I know we've asked for our board um, to provide some additional um, compensation for our folks that are out on the front line um, delivering meals and, and keeping those things going. Um, it won't it won't touch anywhere near all of that, um, but um, we could end up in a situation where we're ending the year with a little surplus um, as a result of those savings. And so uh, we're keeping an eye on it as the pieces come in for sure. Um, so in the, the continuation category, um, this is just an itemization of, of what those items are. Um, and as Dr. Benson alluded to, um, we're in a very fluid situation right now um, uh, with state government. And so um, we don't really know what they're going to do on, on, on some of these respects. Um, we, can, we can look at what was proposed um, in the long session and engage what they were probably going to try to make up ground on this time but now we have a new wrinkle in that conversation and we don't know how they're going to respond to this current situation with the economy um, so the supplement figure that could change as we have conversations with you and and we very much want to be transparent about that and not take something we don't need um, and the other piece that's driving that supplement figure is our k3 class sizes um, we were on track to have an additional 14 teachers in our kindergarten through third grade due to the state lowering those sizes. Uh, there is some conversation that has started that they may put a hold on that. Um, we would have had to have provided local supplement for those 14 teachers. We may not need to do that if they put a delay on K-3. So we, we expect that that part of the calculation could change. And, and we're, we're certainly going to keep Mr. Haygood on the loop on that. The retirement rate increase, we know that that was one of the few things that was accomplished in the long session. They went ahead and determined what that new rate was going to be. It increased from 19.7% to 21.44 for next year. Um, the school based salaries is another category. If the state ends up not doing anything with compensation, uh, that, that's something that we will we'll revisit. Um, the, the charter schools we've discussed uh, quite a bit already. Um, the SRO, SRO rate increase, we're hoping um, to, to keep that in there so that we can continue um, to, to fund those closer to what it's actually costing the municipalities for those SROs. We've got uh, four different law enforcement agencies that we work with to provide SROs. Um, the non-school-based salaries, that's another category that could look different. Um, depending on what happens in Raleigh that we'll certainly keep our eyes on. Um, the ERP modernization is, a, is basically our system we use to manage accounting and human resources. Um, we've been, the state has been using technology that was developed in 1994 up until now. Um, and so they've required us and themselves to move to more modern technology to manage that. Um, and so that would be our annual increase in order to have that more modern system uh, for accounting and HR. 
Um, the health insurance rate was one of two things that, that was addressed in the last session. Uh, that The rate this year was $6,306 per employee for our share of health insurance, and that's going to increase to $6,647 next year, and we, we already know that's a given and that's going to happen. Um, we have two um, Leader in Me schools that the United Way helped to, to kick off uh, for their first year of funding. Those schools are entering their second year of funding, and that's an item we're hoping to keep those programs going at those two schools. Um, okay, let's stop. Mr. Um, Boswell, do you have any questions up till now? Not, not really. I haven't got any questions. I just got one comment on those savings. Be sure to hang on to them instead of finding a place to get rid of them. Say your comment again, please, Mr. Boswell. I said as far as those savings that we're going to see because of the school buildings not being open, let's be sure to hang on to those savings. Yes, sir. I agree. Yeah. Um, Mr. Carter, do you have any questions or concerns at this point? Not at this point, no. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next slide is just an example of, of an exercise that we go through to, to think about or calculate how the supplement, the teacher supplement uh, a rate might increase. So um, so even without the rate changing, if we were to see a change in, in state pay, this is just an example of the prior of the prior year of how the local share of a teacher's pay changed as a result of an increase in state pay um, because we're, we use a percentage-based supplement. Um, so if, if there's a, a state increase of 3%, for example, the local share moves in tandem with that because it's a percentage. Um, but that's one thing that's kept us competitive um, is that we've got that percentage base where some of our neighbors use a flat model. And last year that bumped us ahead of Guilford County as far as the average teacher supplement because they have a flat model. Um, and they they caught on to us, and I think they've they made an increase this year. So it'll be interesting to see where we land at the end of this year. Um, but as of now, we're hanging on to that number ten spot um, through the last payroll period. So that was good to see. Um, the uh, the expansion request. Uh, so teacher supplements. Um, we we did um, use our own funding, our redirection of funding last year to increase that rate from the nine and a half, ten and a half, eleven and a half up to the 0.75 mark. Uh, and so this year, um, our hope is to move that to 10, 11, and 12, um, just to make gradual progress on that front. Um, and so uh, that that was a, a high priority for the Board of Education members um, who vetted the various budget requests that came in. Um, and then. And I'll share that when we went through our process this year, um, I feel a little bit of Mr. Haygood's pain. Um, we had $13 million worth of requests that came from various folks, and we worked hard to try to whittle that down um, to a manageable number, at least what felt manageable six weeks ago. Um, and we put those priorities in front of our board. Um, the next category was athletic trainers. Uh, that is something that started out higher, um, but as a part of our conversations with the Board of Education, um, we carved that down in order to uh, fit in other priorities for the board. Um, that was originally a, a $550,000 item, um, but we looked at a model of having one that was on staff and then contracting out the rest. Um, to The original model was going to have six teachers come on for each high school, teach some things during the day, and then do some athletic training duties after school. Uh, but the new model would move primarily to just contracting with one of the local uh, clinics to provide those services. And um, we, we came up with this number in looking at the average cost of a trainer uh, and looking at our number of practices and sporting events and coming up with the, um, the largest case scenario for that. Um, but that is something that we would ultimately put out for bid um, due to that dollar amount in order to make sure we are getting the best service and the best price. Um, as Dr. Benson shared earlier, um, we we commissioned a classified salary study. Um, it was part of the district strategic plan that we would commission a salary study. Um, part of the delay in the district doing that was it was going to cost, there was a vendor that's very popular um, that wanted to charge $60,000 just to do the study. Um, and some other folks have entered that market. And so it, uh, we, we ended up 
uh, being able to actually conduct the study for less than ten thousand uh, dollars due to competition in that space now so we were it became feasible for us to at least conduct the study uh, we were able to adjust and pay uh, for some of our hard to fill positions uh, starting with this year uh, next year we're looking to close that gap um, and, and improve that improve the pay for some of our other positions um, primarily um, our skilled tradesmen who are folks that are out there doing the work to, to uh, respond to work requests our work order requests in our schools our folks who fix the buses um, folks of that nature uh, folks who process payroll who are handling benefits who are working in our HR area um, as an example um, are some of the larger uh, populations that we would want to address this cycle um, uh, Dr. Benson, uh, Dr. Benson mentioned this request, um, and that's our Chromebook lease. Uh, we have about 8,000 Chromebooks um, that our students, you know, some of those are in use now with our students who um, the licenses to support those are expiring, um, and we would have to uh, purchase new Chromebooks. Uh, we would lease those in order to to mitigate that cost or spread it out over a period of time. Um, and so this estimate's roughly based on a four-year lease. Um, We've seen some other quotes here lately now that other folks have moved into that market. Uh, Staples, for example, has started selling Chromebooks in the past few months, um, and that's starting to drive down the cost, so we could probably get that for less than $550. Um, this is an area where we might, if we if we see some money uh, come to fruition through the CARES Act, technology is supposed to be a big component of that, um, and so this is an area that we may be able to address with stimulus money, and so we will stay in communication with Mr. Haygood about that. Um, make a comment if I might. Yes, sir. I just noted today that also um, Best Buy is carrying Chromebooks, and they had uh, some ver fairly low-priced Chromebooks on in stock, it appeared to. That's good, yeah. So we need more, pe more and more people to get into that to keep driving it down. So that's good to hear. Let me ask you a uh, quick question. Yes, yeah, some of mine feel like I'm getting an answer on it, 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 it'll stay there. Will the trainers have any uh, chain of command uh, with the coaches, or is there, I mean, if, if, if a trainer says he, he shouldn't play, for instance, can, can a coach just say, well, we're sorry how you feel about it, we're going to play him. I mean, you understand my point, right? Is there is there a chain of command there, or a right? So, so the the structure that's been envisioned is that our athletic director, who is on staff, um, will manage that athletic trainer relationship, uh, and so in so he will be enforcing those expectations with the high school and middle school athletic directors to make sure that they're following the recommendations uh, of the trainers. That's the way it should be. Yep. Yeah. So it's got to be a what partnership. Excuse me. Yes, what are sir. we doing now in lieu of having trainers? So right now, the, the North Carolina High School Athletic Association requires that you at least have someone who is uh, certified as a first responder, um, and that level of training is very limited. They are only taking one course in just some basic first aid. Uh, and so, so right now, we're technically meeting the minimum requirement, uh, but not necessarily doing the best that we could. And didn't at one time we have, in, in a lot of cases, and I'm going way back personally, but it uh, seems like I recall even fairly recently the doctors would, local doctors would volunteer and a lot of cases have students on, on in the teams or something of that nature and be volunteering on the sidelines. And that may be. Um, and um, so we, the last time the conversation came up with the district, it's been two or three years ago. I was still in Caswell County. Um, there, there was a local partner that stepped forward that wanted to provide, uh, you know, a, a buy two get one type situation. And so we're hopeful that if we put this out for bid, uh, we'll, we would see something similar emerge. Well, that was just normally if somebody got hurt on the field, he might go out from the sidelines. Yeah. I mean, just back in the old days, I don't know about now. But. Yeah. Okay. Uh, me and the sheriff play football, so we know, don't the sheriff? Yes, sir. <laughs> Rough and tumble. <laughs> yeah. um, so the next category um, is the additional school nurses, and I know uh, Mr. Boswell had a question on that when Dr. Benson was at the podium. So the the cost of a school nurse for us can can range 
on a fairly large scale and it depends a lot of times on the certification that the nurse brings to the table uh, some of the nurses um, have a master's degree in nursing um, and they're getting a certain level a higher level of pay for that nursing experience um, and you know we, we've got some nurses on staff who worked um, in a hospital setting for 25 or more years the state gives them credit for all that experience and they've got a master's degree and so some of them can be quite expensive uh, and so so in this category we're just uh, preparing for um, the most expensive possible scenario with the high salary and benefits um, and so in reality it would come in a little bit under that most likely um, but uh, we've got a goal as a district um, to bring on three additional nurses each year for the next three years and that would fill in our gaps in order for us to have a nurse in each school um, and we had some parent involvement in this budget process and uh, as as the various department heads made their budget presentations this year we did have a parent um, who was participating to provide feedback and he shared um, just how valuable that was to him because one of our school nurses literally saved his child's life um, at, at a high school and uh, his son was having a seizure and and then the nurse made the difference in, in that in the student surviving that situation and so um, I think this is something that we hear a lot of feedback from our parents on and um, we're running into more and more cases where students are bringing medication to school um, having extreme cases of diabetes and in and, and other in other situations where we we need that expertise and uh, and honestly you know when the nurse is not there um, those responsibilities are falling on folks that are nowhere near qualified to deal with it or to administer medicine and it makes them very nervous um, to take on that kind of liability uh, but they do it because they care about the students and, and they, they want them to be well um, so there's a big need to have those nurses there for sure uh, bus driver pay um, has been a hot topic for the past year and a half uh, so we were able to use some of our uh, state transportation dollars this year to do a little bit for our bus drivers we raised their rate uh, 90 cents an hour um, that's what we felt comfortable doing with our, our current state level of funding some of our neighbors uh, move forward with a plan to to raise them to the $15 uh, for the minimum wage to be a bus driver um, Guilford County I think really kicked the ball with that and and so then the domino starts to fall across the state well why aren't we or why aren't we and uh, so then other places that can afford it start picking up that tab and so I know Wake County jumped on board and did the $15 an hour um, and some of our neighbors such as Chapel Hill are already paying more than 15 um, but uh, we, we just want to stay competitive with the counties that are our immediate neighbors uh, so that a bus driver is not tempted to go drive for another county to make 50 cent more 50 cents more an hour or something like that um, and so we feel like if we could get this range in place that would address our immediate bus driver um, recruiting issue um, it, it's part-time work for a lot of them uh, and so it, it's got to be something that's worth their time just to take on those few hours a week in order to drive um, uh, we've had a lot of conversations and a lot of collaboration with the sheriff in the past year about SROs um, and, and providing a an appropriate rate um, and, and how critical that is you know so the rate that we're paying for SROs is very much married to our ability to get additional SROs in the door uh, so it's you know it's difficult for the municipalities to take on additional officers if we're not paying a rate that's at least close to what it's costing them to actually have the officer and um, so we're, we're attacking two fronts with SROs one getting the rate up that we pay and then two trying to make steady progress and adding them um, so the two additional um, that we would want to add this year is one to split between EM Holt um, and Alexander Wilson and that would that would have us at a point where all of our schools in the sheriff's jurisdiction would have coverage um, the elementary schools are half day um, because we're sharing them right now um, but that would get us to a point where there's a permanent <coughs> SRO coverage and they know who that SRO is um, who's going to be there each day um, we will apply for additional state grant funding for that um, this you know we, we went out on a limb this year and added the additional two elementary knowing that we had applied for the state grant Fortunately, come December, they notified us, congratulations, we're, we're going to provide you for a share of those two SROs. 
our hope is to do the same thing this year. Um, it's no guarantee that they will fund the additional one for the EM Holt Alexander Wilson split, or at least part of it. Uh, but we're certainly going to apply to try to make that happen. But we don't want to wait on the grant. We'd like to be able to start the school year, give the uh, give the sheriff the opportunity to find that person, get them through training in the summer, and and let all those chips fall in place. Um, the additional SRO um, is to provide additional support for our secondary schools in the city of Burlington limits. Uh, the chief of police approached us about um, just the level of demand that's on the SROs in those schools right now. Um, <clears throat> and he felt like an additional officer in that space would help them manage the, the growing issues that they're dealing with in our middle and high schools in the city of Burlington limits. Um, and this, um, the 110 figure is driven by the rate that we're hoping to be able to pay this year, uh, the year ahead, is, which is 55,000 per SRO um, in order to meet those needs. Um, and Dr. Benson alluded to this earlier about the, the, the increasing uh, number of students that, that and, and families that need our interpreting services. And so we'd, um, that calculation is for salary and benefits um, in order for us to afford an additional interpreter uh, to help work with our families. As what a, are their, uh, forgive me, uh, what are their requirements there, uh, to be hired? So they, they do have to go through, we have a department, um, so our English language learner department who oversees those folks, um, they have a vetting process to, to assess for their proficiency in writing, verbal and, and, and written abilities in that language um, before they are willing to, to have them fill in that capacity. Do they have to have majored in it anywhere in college? They do not. A number of them are classified employees, and so, um, so they may be folks that just have the fluency. Um, but they don't have to have any necessarily any particular certifications in order to do that. Um, so as we mentioned, we received about $13 million worth of requests from our department heads. And so let's pause and see yeah. uh, at this point, um, Mr. Boswell, do you have any questions or concerns to share? Not at the moment. Okay. And Mr. Carter, I do have one question. Um, I think we heard some information on this a while back. I can't recall what the answer was. Okay. Um, have the respondents to the survey for sending their students to the magnet schools, the uh, tech school and the art school, what were those? And have we looked at how that's going to create, what, what that's going to have an impact on our uh, um, distribution of the popu school population among the other high schools? So that, that is going to have an impact. <clears throat> there, there's some additional information that we are currently collecting. We're under contract with ORED to do a 10-year enrollment projection uh, and narrowly defining the geographical areas within the county so we can see where those, those students are. So we will take the interest that we got from parents in particular programs, which we have solidified to move forward in what we think is going to be a great partnership with the community college for, for both Cummings um, and for um, and for Graham, and then <clears throat> take a look at the um, en enrollment distributions across the uh, county to figure out where those attendance lines may need to be adjusted. We know there's a plan that the board has adopted. We want to make sure that that plan will will generate a significant number of students for those programs. Thank you. Got off easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. You. Very good. Uh, so this, um, we shared this list with the Board of Education, and these were so as we tried to par things down um, it, to come to come to you with a reasonable uh, request. We had some honorable mentions um, for things that folks asked for, and that was additional mental health support, which is at the top of the list. We did not include that in the local request this time because the state did give us additional uh, positions to support mental health, uh, and so with that. Having had that um, fresh money from the state, we put nurses in the request as opposed to mental health because we got some additional support from the state for mental health. Um, our middle school principals requested that we um, find the funds to put a camera system or a surveillance camera system in each middle school. Um, as it exists now, we have one at Broadview Middle School, and we did receive a safety grant uh, from the state in order to put one in Turrentine. So we're now that kids are, are not in the building, they're working on getting that installed now at Turrentine Middle. And so we're, I think each year we're just going to apply for another camera system to try to make that happen with state grant dollars. Um, 
and so we will eventually get to a point to where our middle schools have those um, testing that um, that that's always on the forefront of our principal's minds and having additional bodies available at testing time to administer tests um, <coughs> We, we heard what their needs were, but we felt like that was not a top priority to bring in front of you out of all the other requests that we received. And oddly enough, we're schools closed and we're, we're not having any kind of test administered right now. So, uh, and then our elementary schools had a request to add an additional office support person uh, with, the, with the growing concerns about safety and our new safety protocols for adm admitting folks into the building. Um, they would like another person um, out front to help them manage that. Um, Let's see. So um, another area where we, we have existing state and federal dollars where we could accommodate this request without coming to you for dollars is to increase the pay for our teacher assistants that work specifically with our students who have special needs. Um, their work, right now they are paid in the same manner that a teacher assistant is paid who's working with students who do not have special needs or who do not have uh, significant behavior issues. So we wanted to differentiate that pay a little bit for those folks to incentivize them to take on those more difficult teacher assistant roles um, and so we're using additional state and federal dollars that can be used for those programs to manage that rather than than making that request to you um, and so this is just to, to cap off um, our request so we're, we're seeking an additional 3.3 million um, from you all uh, to manage um, our continuation and expansion request um, as far as capital outlay we're happy with the capital improvement plan that that's been put in place um, and we'd like for that to continue as is that that's working well for us um, and then I put a footnote here in that um, we had additional expansion requests beyond what we're asking for you um, the state um, will owe us some additional dollars uh, through the low wealth funding formula for the year ahead um, that we intend to tap into. Um, we received some updated figures today and so instead of 500 it's going to be closer to 403. Uh, we got that number hot off the press today. Um, we just made a, a guesstimate of where it might land and why did that happen you're wondering. Last year you have raised the property tax rate and that pushed the property tax rate in Alamance County closer to the state average. It pushed it just a hair over the state average. And when that happens, it triggers additional uh, funding from the state level based on how they calculate their low wealth formula. Um, so last, the school year we're in now, for example, um, they gave us 92% of what we would normally be entitled to from state low wealth funding. Um, and one of the triggers that can probe them to release the 100% mark is for you to have a property tax rate that's at the state average or higher. So that happened um, as a result of the bond effort and, and so that has now triggered the state to re release additional dollars to us through that allotment. Um, so we've, we have factored that into our budget math um, that we went over today um, just for transparency. And that spreadsheet they use is three sheets long in order for them to figure out what they're going to give and how much from that allotment. So it's lots of fun. Any additional questions? I had one, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> Mr. I'm, I'm good. Okay. Mr. Carter, do you have any more questions? Uh, no, not right now. Mr. Boswell? No. Right now, no. I remember my question. Great. Uh, who did you say ORID? O -R? Now, that's in Raleigh, right? The state, NC State sanctioned group. Yeah, that's the one that done a couple of reports in the past, I understand. You, you and I have talked about it. Yeah. Uh, when will that be complete? We expect to see uh, preliminary reports by the end of June and final reports in July. Well, I'd like to see see what you get. You know, I know I won't have much longer to do something with it or look at it. But I would like to see it so, just for. I did. I did ask the folks there to to use uh, the smallest planning units possible so that yeah. we could get a really good picture of what's happening across all across the county. Um, I, I found because I've used this company in another um, another system that when when you do that, those projections are. Um, much more closer to what you realize in, in, in at least in the, the next couple of years. So well, I think it's important that. to define who they are. I mean, <laughs> they don't just look at the schools. They look at roads. They look at all infrastructure mm -hmm. for the state. 
and, and it's an interesting group. I mean, really, I mean, I enjoy talking to them when I first heard about it. Now, the they're, they've were they've already started to reach out to folks across uh, the county and the municipality, so it's underway. Yeah. I just had a couple of comments. One, um, I just would feel, I don't know, the, um, the school nurses, I know personally several of the school nurses through different highways and byways I've traveled through life and I know how hard they work and they're so professional and I am sure that our school system would be well served by having three additional school nurses. Um, the ones that I know personally care so much about their students and um, really are there for them when they're, when they're needed. Uh, I would say just in passing that a couple of things that I've heard, well, something I've heard Dr. Benson say before is that the school system is focused on producing outcomes for children. And everything that the school system does should be with that lens of how are we producing outcomes for children. And I just appreciate that so much, Dr. Benson, when I hear you say that. And I hope that, um, you know, the budget's going to be the budget this year. It's going to be pretty tough come from the county with the uncertainty about how the sales tax revenue is going to be impacted and there's going to be a lot of difficult decisions at the county level and I'm sure a lot of difficult decisions for the school board but keeping that lens as you say in your leadership producing outcomes for children is so important and also another thing that I think is really important is remembering the constitutional standard emphasized through the Leandra case of providing a sound basic education so as we go forward and have to make those difficult decisions I think it's good to think does this expense how directly does it relate to providing that sound best basic education for North Carolina's children and in this list of priorities that we have to you know weigh against one another which which priority really goes to the drives to the heart of that providing the sound basic education to the children of Alamance County. So that was just my comment. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say this. Uh, in the bond referendum, what work do you have planned for Bond Road or the whatever? <laughs> None. None. Zero. None. None. Oh, mate. Well, look, yeah. I rode, and I mean this nicely, trust me. Uh, what day was it? What's today, Monday? Oh, I know what Today's you saw. Monday. Yeah, it might have been Saturday or I don't know when it was. But uh, so I was riding around and, and I went to turn around in your parking lot <laughs> and uh, was going to shoot back towards town. I don't know what for. And then I decided to hang a right at the front of the building and I rode around back. And the gates were open and I drove up through the uh, garage doors or whatever. And it, it looked pretty rough back there. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't take much paint to freshen that up I mean yeah. I mean it nicely but yeah you know it looks pretty yeah. can, can we paint that I'll let Dr. Thorpe know that we, <laughs> right. that we could well yeah. you tell him I'll saw that maybe I shouldn't be like if I like the gates one keep Tim out <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been known to snoop sort of around a little bit but yeah. uh, I wasn't snooping I was just looking yeah. And I thought, yeah, I they think, don't paint that door there. I don't paint that or do something with that yeah. one. I think perception, yeah. right? We're very careful to, you know, put the school needs first and yeah. and, and not that building. And, and unless it's an emergency, we generally don't jump on it for that building. But yeah. yeah. A little cosmetic work wouldn't take yeah. much. So, yeah. I'll let him know. All right. Tell him, <laughs> I, tell him I said that. Yeah. And so then my homework is to bring. I went to train candle. school over there. That's, that's, yeah. It was a good building. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it still is. It's got good bones. Yeah, uh, and my homework is a five-year trend on the electricity, just to so y'all yeah, can like see where see that's been. That. Okay, uh, I built it too. Very good. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Next on our agenda is a budget amendment from the health department. Um, so Chair Gant and Jeremy Teeter and Dr. Benson are leaving the room. They're exiting and we're going to get Stacy Saunders, our health director, to come in. And here comes Susan Evans is coming into the room, our um, finance officer. And here's Sheriff Johnson again. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. <laughs> 
what what cartoon was that? You used to say that. You remember that? Cosimini Sam. Do what? I was just Cosimini Sam. I don't know. <laughs> Stacey Saunders, our health director, with a budget amendment. If it's okay with you all, I can give you a COVID update right before. That's what I would love that. Yeah. Okay. That would be great. Great. And then I'll go straight into the budget amendment, if that's all right. Um, so as of today, um, I think you all have heard the history enough, so I'll, I'll let go of that for now and just start with the current um, case counts. And... Um, as of today, the worldwide counts are close to 2.4 million um, with about 165,000 um, deaths, according to um, the verified websites. Um, and then the United States um, were about 757,000 um, cases with about 41,000 um, deaths. And for night in North Carolina, um, 6,764 cases as of today. Um, 179 deaths as of today with 373 hospitalizations um, and affecting 93 counties. Here in Alamance County, we have, um, we identified our first COVID case on March 20th. Um, our cumulative um, COVID case count right now is 55. 39 of those are now out of isolation. 16 are active and of those 16, six of them are seeking care at the hosp at a hospital in um north carolina there have been um, about eighty thousand completed covid tests and in alamance county we've completed reviewing about 600 and that means we've gotten 600 um positives and negatives um and of those that we've gotten um 55 of them have been positive now you must uh, report a positive to us. Um, you do not have to report all the negatives. So I, that is just what we've received um, as far as our testing. As far as the call center, um, the total calls um, thus far are 1,585 with 535 of those being referred to the nurse bank over at the health department. To give you a, um, a bit of context about um, sort of this 4085 type of corridor, um, some of our neighbors are seeing uh, very high cases like Wake, Durham, Orange, um, and Guilford and Chatham. Uh, Wake has 599 cases, Durham has 392, Orange has 187, Guilford has 175, and Chatham has 127. Of those I just listed, um, I would like to note that um, each one of them has at least one or more um, outbreaks in a long-term care facility, a nursing home or a residential area. Um, and I bring that up um, because I want um, to tell you a little bit more about the long-term care facility task force that um, the health department here has put together um, a few weeks ago really for its purpose to prevent and hopefully delay um, outbreaks um, in our own county in congregate living settings. Um, once, illness break, once illness spreads um, in a congregate living facility, it's quite hard um, to make to have it uh, stop spreading and so we want to try to prevent and delay that as long as possible um, and so our health department has been doing a lot of technical assistance with long-term care facilities um, regarding their existing protocols um, imp implementing precautions uh, and subsequently Im implementing the executive order 131 um, <coughs> and also access um, doing some assessing of their ability to collect um, specimen for co uh, for testing and um, us providing that collection when they're not able to do it themselves. And so um, that's our attempt to be proactive um, and help, um, like I said, prevent and delay an outbreak and um, identify it quickly um, when and if it should occur. Do they make those tests <clears throat> on a regular basis, weekly basis, monthly? The collection? Yeah. So it depends on um, the, the facility itself. We've been working with a couple of facilities, um, and if someone has, um, even right now it would be sort of influenza-like because it's very uh -huh. similar to COVID, um, yeah. we would be interested in testing those folks. Um, and so we've been doing that for them um, through our, our nurses have gone and done that. Um, we continue to do the investigation and contact tracing. Um, 
And so this is where we fully in investigate every new case that we receive and the follow-up um, and provide follow-up with any previous cases. And we do that daily um, for each one of those cases that's still active until they're out of isolation. Um, and we look for any changes in their symptoms um, and any other concerns. Um, they, in order to come out of isolation, they must be improving um, and they must have um, been at least seven or more days um, from their first onset of symptoms. It cannot be any less than that. Most of the time it's more than seven days. Um, and on top of that, it has to be an additional 72 hours on top of that 70, those seven days, at least seven days or more um, to be sure that no fever um, comes back and that um, symptoms are still improving. For each one of those cases that are confirmed and that we um, work up and investigate, we also then identify any and all household and close contacts, and that's anybody within six feet for more than 10 minutes, um, and follow up with them daily as well um, to make sure that they're not um, developing any symptoms. So those folks are asymptomatic and are in quarantine, and they must stay in quarantine for 14 days um, post their last exposure to the positive case. Um, if symptoms occur for um, someone who is being uh, monitored, any symptoms, it doesn't have to be all symptoms, just one is enough for us to then refer them for testing. Um, this was a four nurse team. We've expanded that to six um, now due to the number of cases, um, active cases, and the increasing number of close contacts um, based on those cases. And um, I discussed the long-term care facility task force. Uh, we continue to have our housing insecure task force as well, which is a multidisciplinary team um, who work to identify temporary housing um, solutions should a case need um, a place to stay during their isolation. Um, we also have looked at alternate transport uh, for non-medical types of things, um, particularly um, if there's for an individual that could use transport potentially for a positive or a suspect case um, to temporary housing, say, if they don't have their own transport. Um, so looking at that, should we need it? Um, and also the work site task force. This is also nurse driven. Um, we've been contacting and following up with any work sites or workplaces that call us for guidance. Um, we provide them with precautions and um, help in implementing guidance. Um, to their best ability um, and also work with HR departments and occupational health uh, regarding those precautions, the quarantine protocols. We continue to do our community messaging on our website, on the county's website, um, on social media, um, and then provide technical assistance to county, city governments, um, the school system, other community partners regarding um, essential personnel, um, precautions and whatnot. So I can go on to the budget amendment if you'd like for me to I'd like to ask two or three questions if you don't sure. mind. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, number one, you uh, cite here, and so does Johns Hopkins, uh, the, uh, the United States has the most confirmed cases in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you comment on that? I'm sure uh, a lot of that's driven by the size of the country, but also, you know, uh, is somebody lying? Or, I mean, China, for instance, they're only showing 80, 80, 88 or 89,000. You know, they wouldn't lie. Yeah, but is it that we're testing so much better than everybody else, or can you comment on that? So um, the more you test, the more you find. Um, so that's sort of rule of thumb, um, mm -hmm. and that um, typically as collection and testing opportunities pre present themselves, you know, in the beginning there were um, limitations to the testing. There was some supply chain issues. Some of that's starting to get better. Um, and so as collection and testing opportunities present themselves in communities, not just this one, but all across the United States, more people are able to get tested that um, may not have been able to get tested before. And so as you test more, you find more. Um, that is typically the case. Um, depending on where folks are in um, their curves, you might see cases for certain countries stagnate and start to case per day go down, right? <coughs> Um, and so wherever they are in their curve could indicate their magnitude of cases as well. So if their curve has already peaked and coming down the other side, it's unlikely that they'll esca well, at this point, if they're coming down the other side, the escalation that we're seeing, you know, when we come up on a peak might not be there anymore. So you start to see cases per day decrease. And so um, for the United States, 
we are still in this place where we're um, seeing cases increase daily. Um, and so it's more likely to see those uh, numbers increase okay. over time. Well, this question, second question may be somewhat, you, you could possibly read into it in my opinion, but uh, <coughs> you, you said the first case was uh, March, uh, what, 20th? For okay. our county. Okay. Now, you got, it's, it's, it's been a month, mm -hmm. barely a month. You've had 55 confirmed, 39 in and out pretty quick, less than 30 days, mm -hmm. 16 active, six in the hospital. What did you see or not see in the 39 that went in and out pretty quick? I mean, what did you see now or not see in them when they were released or so-called classified as recovered that you saw when they were confirmed? What's the difference? What they what must meet certain criteria to be out of isolation. And what were what was the what was the criteria that put them in isolation, and what was the criteria that took them out? The criteria that put them in isolation was the confirmed test. And what is? Would you please define that? The confirmed COVID test. And what is that? A PCR test. And is that the nasal thing you were telling me about? The nasal pharyngeal collection uh -huh. uh, that then is run through PCR. Uh -huh. And so that that came back positive and so puts those folks in a confirmed case count. They are then isolated. They're isolated at the time of their collection of their test, to be uh -huh. honest. Um, and uh -huh. then when the test results come back and they're positive, they stay in isolation. Right. So in order to come out of isolation, they must have been their health must be improving. It must be at least seven days since the onset of their symptoms. It cannot be any less than that. Most are, are a little bit longer than that, but it can't be any less than that. And then on top of that, it has to be another 72 <coughs> hours to make sure that there is no fever and that symptoms are still improving. Okay. And that allows them to come out. And see, you and I talked, and I appreciate you calling me, and uh, uh, and I'm not trying to debate it. Other, I want to know information. I want to be able to talk about it. My brother down in Charlotte is raising hell at me for even going outside of the house, you know. And uh, uh, I just, but, and I asked you, and you, and I, I'd like to get you to publicly respond to my question of, i.e., now, for instance, the 39 that came out. They, they were in, they've been in and out in less than 30 days. Okay, and they were confirmed mm -hmm. whenever. And, and probably a good bit of them and had, were, were not in and out but two weeks, three weeks, you would assume, because surely that didn't all go in the same day. And I asked you about whether or not uh, if you ran that same test that seems to be so concise, uh, so uh, decisive, that if you ran it again on the day that they were lit out, or, or, or so-called put in the recovered category that they that nothing would show up and, and 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 if I'm not mistaken you said not necessarily would that be the case that depends uh -huh. it depends because PCR um, is a test that looks for genetic material of the pathogen mm -hmm. and so um, if there's residual um, genetic material PCR could potentially pick it up if the sensitivity and specificity of that test is quite good like very low, depending on um, versus very low levels of genetic material um, or moderate and high, what you would see at the height of illness. And so it could potentially pick up any residual PCR. Um, so I can't say for 100% certainty that if you get did a PCR on someone who had been sick for um, 10 days, um, symptoms were improving and we added another three days onto it so we're at about 13 or 14 days um, I can't tell you that a hundred percent of the time that they would be negative on a PCR repeat mm -hmm. but you're not doing one is that correct that's correct mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna ask you how it's, it's it's a loaded one okay very hypothetical very rhetorical do you think we're too quickly c confirming people is is happening in, in certain areas and, and the reason I say the premise of my question is how in the world in my opinion can 39 go in in less than 30 days be recovered you understand my point I think so I'm not so, trying to be lackadaisical or, or play it down but it just seems like the law of averages just wouldn't be there medically so remember mm -hmm. when someone goes in for a test mm -hmm. their provider is sending them home to be isolated right 
So we might not get notification of that test result for two to three days. And there for a little while, if it was going to a commercial lab, it might have been like five days. Mm -hmm. So that person might have been in isolation for quite a bit of time. And once we get the notification of them being positive, we then see that as a positive case for us. And so the reporting to us may have been anywhere from two to five days after they received their collection for their test. And so that that onset of symptoms happened much more much earlier than what the test notification to us was mm -hmm. and so um, I think what you all are you know what you're seeing is when we um, get notification of a test as as point zero and that's not point zero point zero was actually days before um, the notification of the test is just when we get that and that we count that in our account at the, at, as our official count and so it may seem like folks are coming in and out rel relatively quickly, but they've actually been in isolation longer than we actually received their test result. Does that make sense? Well, I hear it, yes. Yeah. Uh, d does a patient or, or, or a, a person, a citizen, have a, a right to a second opinion on this as they would any other medical procedure? To receive a second test? Mm, after or a second opinion with somebody, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Every patient reserves the right for a second opinion from their medical providers. Um, so we don't we don't ask for a second test to, to confirm someone's positive positive result. Uh, that PCR is what we consider to be the standard. And when someone tests positive using PCR, then that means the virus DNA is um, actively you know is uh, being able to be detected at that point. Yeah. Well, no offense, I don't appear to be negative. I know this is going to appear to be negative, but it's hard for me, please believe me, to comprehend that 39 people in less than 30 days were diagnosed as having it, and then less than a month later, they don't have it, enough to be on their own. That, I, it's hard for me to comprehend that or buy that, to be quite honest about it. So out of mm -hmm. isolation is different than fully recovered. Someone It might take someone a, a lot longer to feel totally back to normal mm -hmm. with themselves, right? So out of isolation is based on very um, clear sort of guidance around someone's um, symptomatic um, progression. Mm -hmm. Feeling recovered might take longer for some than others. And that's why we don't use that term recovered because I may be 10 days out, I'm, I'm feeling better, I don't have a fever anymore, I might have a little bit of a cough left but it's nothing like what I had before, I'm able to move around, it's been 10 days, I've, I'm feeling better, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then they're gonna add three more days onto it um, so really around day 14 is when I'm going to come out of isolation. I still might feel like, whew, I went through some stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I might not still be 100% as far as like my own um, feeling of my own subjective recovery. Um, but that person has met the criteria um, for being out, out of isolation at that point. For someone else, their isolation might be longer. Um, their symptom progression, they might not progress to improving symptoms for 14 days, um, and that, that's occurring, 14 um, and even longer, um, to where we, we haven't even, even been able to tack on the three days yet. Because um, we do not tack on that three days until we say, all right, you, you sound better um, and your, all your symptoms have improved and we haven't seen a fever since we started talking to you. Now, tomorrow, we'll start the 72 hours and watch you for three more days uh -huh. at that point. So it depends on each person. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm a numbers guy at times and, and here's my third one. It's a number question. Okay. You know, I ask you to uh, put together and I thank you. I'm gonna have to get out my own calculator though. <laughs> Take population versus uh, cases, okay? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I can run my own percentages, but I was trying to see if there was a correlation between the counties with uh, low numbers, low percentages uh, versus population, density, uh, that the population, uh, you know, geographically that they run. To give you an example, now, unless I've just misunderstood what I did, and I, it won't be the first time, I took Alamance County and I divided the number of cases and I'm not going to fib to you. I don't know if it was the 22 that you were showing or the or the 49 or 47. I don't remember. I don't think mm -hmm. that's really the issue. But I divided the number of the population into that, okay? 
and I came up with uh, one barely one tenth, a little bit over one tenth of one thousandth. I said it of our population that's got it or has had it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, barely one tenth, a little bit over of one thousandth. That's assuming that everyone got a test and that the rest of the folks. I understand were it. Negative. Well, but you, you got that same situation somewhere else as well. In Mecklenburg County was one thousandth ten times though that's the way I read that math now I might be wrong ten times still small numbers but wh what would you attribute the comparison of us in Mecklenburg and, and, and the the number glaring differences there one, one, one tenth of one thousandth but versus one thousandth mm -hmm. Uh, well, That's Mecklen a big difference. Mecklenburg is uh, very different than Alamance um, as far as its population density, particularly in its largest municipality, mm -hmm. uh, being Charlotte. Um, that's vastly different than our largest municipality um, in Alamance. And so, um, you know, as we've watched the U.S. and bigger cities, um, the closer that folks are living to one another, um, the more likely there are going to be interactions and exposure. Um, the more likely that there's interaction and exposure, the more likely um, folks are to transmit. So I think that population density is um, particularly is one particular thing that folks can look at. The fact that people are just tight together, is that what you're saying? Uh, in in uh, large urban areas, most mm -hmm. certainly, um, that they're, uh, with that type of population density in, in larger urban areas, the likelihood of being able to interact with others um, is far greater um, than some of your less population <coughs> dense, dense um, areas. Okay. I appreciate you putting yeah. up with me. And that was my son calling. I, I need to call him real quick. Absolutely. Thank you. Shall we take a short recess? I believe last week I asked um, Mr. Albright if one of the commissioners being present leaving for a reason means we lose our quorum. And you said last week that it did. So yes. We'll take a read. The uh, COVID outbreak for Stacy. If not, you can go ahead with your okay. budget amendment. All right, so before you, um, we have a budget amendment. Uh, the health department has received notification of funding um, from the Division of Public Health, um, Public Health Pre Preparedness and Response, Response Branch to carry out surveillance, epidemiology, um, lab capacity, infection control, mitigation, communication, and other preparedness um, and response activities related to COVID. And so on March 6th of 2020, um, our President of the United States signed into law the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act. Um, this act um, provides funding to prevent, um, prepare for, and respond to COVID. And um, we have received $128,163 to be spent toward implementing and scaling up um, one of the things that that um, one of the deliverables is implement and scaling up our efforts including access um, to testing um, and collection conducting and supporting surveillance to identify cases um, report case cases um, and do additional surveillance and so that's what you have before you you need a motion I'm sure thank you so moved Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Boswell. Does anybody have any questions or concerns? If not, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion carries 5-0. Thank right. you so much. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, next on our agenda are the public speakers who wish to be heard on non-agenda related items. And I think we had a few emails that were submitted to the clerk, to the board. So, clerk, if you would read those at this time. Okay, the first one is from Elizabeth Smith, 1002 Scotchway Pine Medden, and her topic was reopening of the county. We want a resolution and want to know that you are doing your part to go ahead and start the reopening under safe conditions. 
The second one is from Betsy Adams 317 Bidney Drive, Burlington. Her topic was budget and tax increase. Now is not the time to consider increasing taxes on citizens of Alamance County. If business owners and their employees must cut spending, then perhaps it is time for all government agencies in the county to do the same. The next one is from George Adams, 317 Bidney Drive. His topic is COVID-19 pandemic should put a freeze on the county's annual big spending tax hike plans. Before you vote, please take time to read last April 9th Alamance News editorial called COVID-19 pandemic should put a freeze on county's annual big spending tax hike plans. 181 million is requested with already 8.4 over projected revenues. Now because of COVID-19, it will be at least 15 million over. I hope you know that there are a lot of former working people who are now are unemployed by government fiat. The last comment is from Joe Tickle, 3148 Garden Road, Burlington. This topic and comments run together. Before you vote to raise county taxes, put your conscience to work, asking if you could raise taxes on the people after what we have been through. Our property taxes should be cut with the wannabe projects being put on hold. People are out of work, not enough money to get by on, much less pay additional taxes. The count should think about lowering taxes or a tax free year. The county needs to cut wannabe projects and create a tax free year for our county residents. The people have no money, no jobs, and are just getting by. Please do not make this situation any worse than it already is. If you vote to take more money from the people, that must do without food and medicine, your conscious needs help. If you put the projects and raises above survival, what is the world becoming? And that is the last one. All right, thank you. Do we have any commissioner's responses to those public comments? Well, I would like to talk. No. To Go ahead, Eddie. Oh, no, I didn't no. have any and I just answered. <laughs> Okay. What did he say? He said he was just answering. He didn't have a comment. Okay. Uh, about the reopening. <clears throat> uh, you know, I'd like to ask a technical question. What did our state of emergency here add on to what the governor had done? Uh, you know, his, I mean, what did we, did we do anything above and beyond his or what? How, how, how we did, did not. We did not. Okay. I think he was a little fast to make that decision. I think he needs to get off his his butt and uh, open up the state. Well, I'll assure you he won't do anything that he sees other people doing it. That's, That's for sure. Yeah, he's, I, I he's not a do he's yeah. not a doer. He's a, a setter. Mr. Carter, do you have any responses to the public comments? No, 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 I don't. Okay. Anything else? Did we do your letter? No, uh, that's under commissioner comments. I was oh, so going you're going to do, do that. that. Okay, yeah. good. All right. Fine. Thank you for I think it's a good letter. Thank you. Um, Mr. Haygood, do you have a county manager report? Uh, the only thing I would bring to the commissioner's attention, we are working on uh, the budget for fiscal year 2021 at this time. And I would suggest to the commissioners that uh, last time we met, uh, I suggested that I would bring a recommended budget on May 18th. I'd like to suggest to the commissioners that I do that on June 1. I feel like the, the more data we can get about how uh, sales tax revenue is doing this year, and we see what the governor is going to do, what the economy may do, uh, it, it would really help, I think, us bring uh, the best recommended budget to you that we can. So uh, it doesn't take any kind of a vote, but at this point, I'll be planning to bring you a recommended budget on June the 1st. I mean, is that tonight we would suppose, or is that morning or night? That's a morning meeting. So. All right, is that uh, uh, a meeting it, it would be 
expected that we would vote? Usually no. Uh, usually I'll, I'll bring the recommended to the commissioners at a daytime meeting and then the next meeting will be June the 15th. The that would be when you'd have your public hearing and then uh, we might, that might cause us to need to set a special meeting after the 15th to vote on the budget. But I think there would be enough time to do that after the 15th and before June the 30th. So um, as a rule, I've, if I'm not mistaken, I presented to recommend it during the daytime meeting mm -hmm. uh, past couple of years. Yeah, because I think we need to talk about it. Sure. Yeah, and um, couldn't talk about it at last meeting mm -hmm. much. And I thought we were talking about it tonight, to be quite honest about it. And uh, so if we wait to then, that's fine with me as long as we don't vote and uh, sure. and uh, knock, it, knock it back and forth a little bit. Well, that, usually, that gives a couple of weeks. Uh, once it's presented to, to talk about for, for the board to talk to each other and to me about what you think about it and if you agree uh, is it reasonable or not or what what should change or you know, whatever take the commissioners have so. we can have we have to have a public hearing before we adopt the budget but we can have the public hearing the same night that we vote on the budget <laughs> although that's not necessarily the best way to do it it'd be better to have a public hearing and then have a period of time where we get to reflect on what the public has said but given the circumstances we'll just see how to see how things are going around June 18th if we want to um, have a special meeting just to vote on the budget we might even just decide. yeah I think I, this is my opinion I think it's wise to hold off as long as we can just to see where we are and what we're going to be doing Great. yeah it's going to take a while for the economy to return to normal take a long time yeah long time and legally gonna, i think it's important at least state it whether we believe in doing it or i mean we've never done it not since i've been up here but you don't have to have it approved on june uh by fiscal year start july 1st sure. has, has anybody ever gone into the fiscal year i don't i'm i'm not aware of alamance county ever having done I that we have is, is anybody in the state ever done it? uh i don't know i'm sure they have uh i'm sure it's been done at some point in a county's history in the state but i'm yeah. not aware of it but my goal would be to bring you a budget that would uh take into consideration as best we know what's going on with revenues and uh try to give some options and that's kind of what we're looking at right now is if, what do we think may happen with revenues the information we're hearing from the association of county commissioners in particular uh is as uh, we think is proving to be pretty helpful to give us a scope of this is this going to be a 12 to 18 month recovery which is possible and if so i, I would prefer to have a budget brought to you that you feel like you could adopt and and go forward with rather than an interim but it's not beyond the pale to consider that uh, no, i don't budget. think i could support the interim I yeah. mean, i'm ready to i'm ready to vote now <laughs> well I, I, I based think, on what i've looked at i think i I would like to think I can bring you a budget that enough of you can agree on and, you know, balances uh, the concerns we all have about the economy here, what kind of revenues we're going to be looking at, as well as the services that we need to continue to provide. And, uh, you know, that's, that's my job to bring that to you. And I hope I can do that in a way that uh, enough folks will agree makes sense. So. All right. Steve Carter, do you have any? Thing you want to say about the county manager's report or anything? Are you good? Are you there? Excuse me, I had it on mute. <laughs> okay. I think I might have tried to speak over Bill a minute ago, but I I, I, I agree with what uh, county manager is saying. The um, the more knowledge we have going into the final stage of the budget process, the better off we're going to be. So. Agreed. All right, Commissioner comments. Do any of the commissioners have any comments tonight? I want to say that I don't want to see any increases in the budget, and I'm not going to support any. Mr. Carter and Mr. Boswell, do you have any commissioner comments tonight? No, I'm good for right. I'm good. Okay, I had one thing I was going to, in this uh, virus crisis, I've had a lot of conversation, people asking me about broadband access in rural parts of the county. And so I was just going to ask Brooks Walker, our um, IT department head, to sort of address that very briefly 
so that the public can be aware of what efforts the county has been making over many years, quite a few years, to try to bring broadband access to our rural areas. Well, we've uh, recognized this problem a long time ago before this happened. Of course, the COVID-19 has caused it to exasperate, and we've had a number of phone calls uh, asking about it. And what we've done is, what can we do as a low-hanging fruit? Um, you know, there is some federal dollars out there, but up until we've been recently considered a kind of a tier three county, which means we have a lot of internet access. But because they count the county as a whole, not the rural and urban areas separately, there's a have and have not situation there. And so we've been trying very hard through a survey and stuff like that to kind of um, get some information to the state and federal government to say, hey, you can't look at the county along the I-40 corridor. There's people out in the county, myself is one of them, I think Amy, you're another one. Mm -hmm. uh, there are folks out there and it, it's becoming almost a necessity. People have small businesses that are working from home and those kinds of things. Uh, I'd love to give you a great answer that we just turn a switch and it's working, but it's not. Um, if you, one of the things that you fill out your census, that's going to lead to more accurate information. We've got our math that we want to give to the state. I sat in a meeting today about these kinds of things. A lot of your internet service providers right now are offering relief, COVID relief. Um, there's also additional tools. There are things called MiFi's that are better than cell phones. Um, that are waiving fees. They're connecting people for um, for a lower rate or for free, depending on if you qualify. A lot of times you can get um, um, increase to the amount of usage, uh, data usage, uh, unlimited for a period of time if you just have to apply. We have all those resources or, or uh, we point to those local vendors that will, uh, the national vendors that will do that. Um, and they also have turned on all like some private uh, Wi-Fi at certain locations that are open. You can pull outside and do that. All those things are available if you go if you go to Verizon, they have a COVID-19 response. If you go to Spectrum, they have COVID-19 response, and they have they've li listed out those things, and they actually change them every day. Uh, that being said, nobody's digging a new line to people, um, and 5G is not here, and so uh, I, I've heard a lot of stories. People are trying to figure out how to do work from home and have three kids all do their online work, and it's very difficult. Um, and so, you know, I think this is going to change the national conversation, the state and national conversation about what, you know, freeing up some more money for these things because it may be the new normal. There may be more people learning from home or those kinds of things. Yeah. And it's, they can't just have the old modem, they have to have this connectivity. Teachers are putting high definition videos out there for kids or they're doing the Zoom or all those kinds of things. So. Had a few number of phone calls. We on our website we have still have the survey going on, and we and we're pointing to all those resources locally. If you go to our, our web page and look at the splash page, it talks about internet access. It's all there. But I would also say it's it's changing so much that if you have AT and T, go to their website, and it's, sometimes it's just filling out a form, and you can get much larger data usage and those kinds of things. But again, for those that don't have it or they just use their phone. It's still quite difficult, and I know everybody on this board um, and everybody in this room knows it's a big problem, and the school system knows the problem too. So uh, it's a it's a very expensive problem. So. Well, thank you, thank you, um, Mr. Albright. Did you have a, a statement that for um, the board or for the public tonight? <clears throat> Mr. Carter asked me to prepare a statement regarding the conclusions drawn. Um, following the review of the snow camp quarry permit. So I have prepared a statement. I emailed a copy of it to each of you this morning. And I'll go ahead and read that if you Yes, like. please. <clears throat> After a thorough and complete review of the file and available materials, the independent attorney retained by the Alamance County Board of Commissioners reached the following conclusions. The intent to construct permit has not expired. Alamance aggregates in the development of the quarry remains vested with the rules and standards set forth in the Heavy Industry Development Ordinance of October 3rd, 2011. 
The issuing of the intent to construct permit is not in conflict with the heavy industrial development ordinance of October 3rd, 2011. A stream buffer will remain in effect 100 feet of either side of any stream. The issuing of the intent to construct permit is not in conflict with the heavy industrial development ordinance land use spacing standards and nothing in the facts of North Carolina, nothing in the facts or in North Carolina law justifies a revocation of the intent to construct permit at the present time. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Craig Justice of the Van Winkle Law Firm for his work and dedication to this review. Alamance County will be proceeding based on his recommendations made in that review. Great, thank you, Mr. Albright. Sheriff, did you have something you wanted to address the board about? Yes, very, would, very uh, we had a lot of damage in the southern part of Alamance County. And I was talking to Mr. <coughs> Chris Braxton and lost about everything he had down there. I saw him and I wanted to let the commissioners know you need to come down and look at the damage in that part of the county. And uh, let's don't forget them because there was a lot of homes that was not insured that was damaged or destroyed. And uh, get a chance, if you want to ride down, come up, to Dawson, I'll take you down and show you something. I would love to do that. I would take. Yeah. Thank you. Let's set that up. Everybody. Thank you. Can I ask quite a question in regards to what? Of course. Did, did they give a report on what did they suggest that we should add anything to our ordinance? Uh, you know, we asked him to do that. I haven't seen that yet. Uh, he is working on that, but uh, with the COVID crisis, he's had some trouble getting to his office, as has everyone. But I will follow up yeah. with that. I just remember we asked him. Yes. Okay. The final thing I have in my in the commissioner comments, um, I have drafted a letter to the governor Cooper, um, and I'll just go ahead and read it. Uh, a copy of it has been forwarded in advance of the meeting to the other commissioners. It's addressed to the Honorable Roy Cooper, North Carolina Office of Governor. Dear Governor Cooper, on behalf of the people of Alamance County, thank you for your diligence and hard work in addressing the difficult challenges raised by the COVID-19 crisis. I write to you today to request that you adopt the regional approach, leveraging relationships between local governments in targeted areas and releasing from statewide orders the many communities the data reveal are minimally impacted by the virus. The map of counties with the greatest number of confirmed cases provides a path to a regional approach. 30 counties in North Carolina make up 86% of the COVID-19 case count. However, executive orders cover the entire state without regard to the severity of the outbreak. Instead of crafting statewide restrictions, I respectfully ask that you consider a regional approach of working with local governments to keep necessary restrictions in place in the areas that have been hard hit by the virus while allowing rural counties and towns to begin rebuilding their communities. Many have applauded your analogy of lifting the restrictions of lifting of restrictions to a dimmer light switch with incremental adjustments and a regional approach could be an important component of that strategy. Children in rural counties where lack of internet access is a huge obstacle for online er learning could return to school. Rural hospitals, which have been financially devastated by the inability to perform elective procedures, are not in danger of being overwhelmed by COVID-19 patients and should be able to resume normal operations our fragile rural economies could begin the cost of re the process of rebuilding. I ask you to personally reach out to the leaders of the counties and cities where the virus has hit the hardest, starting with the 30 counties that account for 86% of the cases, asking for cooperation in approving local restrictions that continue stay at home orders. This is not to advocate for a patchwork of confusing and complex restrictions that vary widely between counties. Local governments should work in tandem, adopt restrictions that have demonstrated their effectiveness, and create a swath of protection where it's needed. The statewide approach was appropriate for the first few weeks of this crisis as we learned how the virus spreads. However, now that we have data and can see how the virus has impacted communities, 
we can draw on our experience to work together and moving forward with a regional approach. Sincerely, Amy Scott Gailey, Chair, Alamance County Board of Commissioners. So I um, began thinking of this idea of a regional approach when I was looking at the News and Observer newspaper um, article. They have a regular COVID-19 uh, update and they have a map of North Carolina that's co color coded showing where the most cases are. And it's very clear from looking at that map that along the I-40, I-85, I-77 corridor, and then some going 95 south toward Cumberland County, that that is where the majority of the cases, 86% of the cases belong to 30 counties. Sadly, 70 counties holding up the other 14%. And so this letter is to suggest that the governor consider um, working with local governments, working with us, as part of that dimmer switch to <coughs> say, okay, Wake County, you need to keep the same stay at home restrictions in place. So I request Wake County that you board of commissioners and city of Raleigh, you all need to do this plan. This is the plan for you. However, a county that is um, relatively remote and relatively unimpacted by the crisis would not need to have those same restrictions and acknowledging the difference in our geography and the difference in our population densities. So that's the purpose for my letter. And um, I bring it up tonight, just kind of asking if there is a consensus with the other commissioners that um, they agree that this is appropriate. I think it's a great, great like letter. It. I'm not 50. When I first saw it, I thought, well, you know, it's gonna be harder for us to uh, ask the governor to call it all off, you know. That's the first thing I thought. But hearing you read it has convinced me that's I like that. Well thank you. Thank yeah. you, Commissioner Sutton. Um, Mr. Boswell. Are you still there? I'm I'm hanging out here just listening. <laughs> oh, okay. Do you have any uh any uh comments about the letter that I've drafted? I I think you did a great job on it. Thank you. Mr. Carter, do you have any concerns or comments about the letter that I've drafted? I agree with Eddie. I think you did a, a, a great job of coming up with some appropriate suggestions to the governor. I just hope he has, has a, a bent to listen to you and the other county commissions that are sending similar letters to him. So, Well, thank you. Um, it's very important to me that um, everyone understands the uh, respect that I have for Governor Cooper and the job that he has done heretofore in handling this very, very difficult situation. But um, I hope that he's the kind of leader who listens to other voices from other places, that he is open to um, hearing from people out here um, with maybe a different perspective than what he's gonna get from inside the Beltway in Raleigh. So thank you and I will sign the letter and uh, Tori is going to mail it to him and also email it and I believe that our public information officer will have a press release related to it. So, if that is all of the business before the board tonight, we will be adjourned. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Grand. Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on LocalGovTV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 
124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.